Welcome to Interviewing Authors with your host, Tim Knox. Hi, everyone. Welcome into another edition of Interviewing Authors. Sylvia Acevedo is my guest today. Sylvia is the author of one of my favorite new books, God Awful Loser. It is a humorous look at what would happen if Cupid, the god of love, all of a sudden became human. And it follows Cupid through his uh, exploits and his attempts to get back into the, the realm of the gods. I had a great time interviewing Sylvia. She is, uh, when she's not writing funny books like God Awful Loser, she uh, does television. She's a reporter. She does uh, a number of hosting duties on local television. Uh, just a joy to talk to. We talked about uh, not only her, her writing career, but we talked about television. We talked about marketing. Uh, we talked about all the things that you need to think about when you're an author, because as we keep telling you, on this show, uh, when you are self-publishing, and quite often when you're not, you are the man or the woman. You are the one that is responsible for getting your work out there, getting in front of people, doing the marketing, and doing everything that goes along with it. And Sylvia is doing a wonderful job. Uh, love this book, God Awful Loser. Kept me laughing the entire time. I think you will enjoy it too. So let's get going. Here's my interview with Sylvia Acevedo author of God Awful Loser, on today's Interviewing Authors. Sylvia, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Tim. I'm so excited to have you here. I'm going to learn about you and your book and uh, maybe even a bit of a Spanish lesson along the way. <laughs> <laughs> you can say my name. You can do it. There you go. Well, before we get started, if you will, give the audience a little background on you. Sure. Uh, I am a journalist. I've spent the past 20 years as a television news reporter and anchor in various markets across the country, um, covering everything from international stories to presidential elections and breaking news for CNN and the local state fair. So I've done a whole lot of everything in my years in TV, and I also have done newspaper and radio. And uh, right now, I occasionally guest host a television more talk show on the Milwaukee NBC station. So I've had a pretty varied background in journalism covering kind of all of the media. Well, you know, I find that very interesting, and I'm not going to let you get away with that. We're going to go back a little more because <laughs> I, I, I don't know if you, if you know uh, Susan Solovic, who, who works for Fox. Uh, she has been on the program, and she talks about mm -hmm. uh, when she went into television, she was actually a lawyer, uh, the makeover that ensued. And she was actually, she's actually an American Indian and had very dark curly hair. Now she looks like your typical fox blonde clone type. So how, how did uh, – take us back a little bit further because where, where were you raised? I was raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, so I'm currently living in my hometown. And uh, I really didn't choose journalism until college when I took a mass communications class and found out, hey, I, I could write. Now, I've been reading my whole life. And, and I just spent countless hours in the library, and I just I, I loved everything about literature. Um, but I never really thought about writing as a career until college. And I took the journalism route because uh, they assigned us to do a report, and lo and behold, I could do it. And, and it, it all kind of fell into place, and I spent um, just many, many years thinking of writing as you are telling the world what happened what happened at the city hall meeting, what happened when the um, election happened, uh, what happened at the terrible shooting down the street. Um, but um, when I had to, when, with my transition, when I had to start writing fiction, it was pretty hard to, um, to write a story that you fleshed out a lot and you didn't just try to give the whole story in two sentences uh, or in a minute 10 in TV. So uh, I, I can understand what she, where she's coming from about the transition. It's it's not all that easy. Right. So you were actually drawn to journalism because of the writing, but you ended up being on camera. And I've, I've seen your video. You do a wonderful job, which I, I think you have to – it's almost a natural talent, I think, to be on, on camera talent. But did you enjoy the on-camera part as much as the writing, or were you always just uh, the, the writer more so? No, I definitely enjoy the on camera, and it's, I especially like it because you can have that spontaneity. You can have um, someone just throw in a question that you perhaps weren't ready for, um, but but you can give an honest answer, and you as the interviewer, you can throw a question to someone, which I, I'm sure you enjoy doing that, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Who, me? No. no. But, uh, but I love the immediacy of um, the live setting of TV, and while I did a lot of prepackaged writing for newspaper and radio and TV, I, I did a whole lot of live reports. In fact, I'd probably say 85% of my reporting was live. 
I find that interesting because I, I've done some on-set business analyst stuff on television, and I've got really good friends. One of my best friends is a, a local anchor, and he's been doing it for years, but he still will tell you he lives in fear of the blooper reel. Oh, yeah. Well, when YouTube <laughs> came around, when the Internet came around, yeah, we all saw that coming. We all knew that. Some, we, we were gonna, there's no way to avoid that you're going to do something um, – ridiculous or just, you know, someone's going to be jumping in the background of your scene. Um, I remember doing a live shot at a Halloween um, festival uh, on State Street in Madison, Wisconsin, which is pretty famous nationwide. And I was scared to death that people were going to flash the camera. So I actually <laughs> did the live shot in with my cameraman going in a circle around me where I just kept turning to face the camera so that no one had a chance to stand behind us too long. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I don't know if you saw it, but there was a, a speaking of YouTube video last year. A video came out, and there was a, a a young female reporter on the street doing a live shop a live shot, and there was some idiot kept coming up behind her screaming, and she just elbowed him right in the nose and laid him, and then just continued on with the live shot like nothing had happened. So a very a true you professional. Know, I did, I, <laughs> I, I I missed that one, but I can tell you a lot of you know when when reporters are doing their reports, they have sometimes they haven't spent a lot of time if it's something that's just happening right there in the spur of the moment. But a lot of times they've spent days or weeks or months trying to prepare a report, and then to have someone come and um, move around behind you, I mean, you know, you're ruining a day's work at exactly. least. Exactly. So well, I, I can see why some sometimes people get upset. But but what I would do is I would just tell the people just wave behind me, we'll get you on. That's all they want. They just want to be on TV. Who just can shut, blame up, them on, shut right? up and wave. <laughs> well, I, you know the the I I, I just I, so many of those stories, and uh, I'll tell you some more when we go off mic here. But uh, we want to talk today about about your writing career, about your book uh, "God Awful Loser," which is one of my favorite books. I laughed through this book, and let me tell you, I'm a hard one to make laugh. And so uh, we are going to get oh, into that. You. But uh, let's talk a little bit more about your, your background. Uh, you, you were drawn to journalism because of the writing. Had you always been a writer before? Had you written stories? I had not always been a writer. Um, I did the typical you know, school assignments that you're told to do. And uh, I liked the writing. But um, no, it wasn't a creative outlet for me uh, until about 10 years ago. And that's, you know, I was full on into my journalism career. And I had had many years of writing, um, but I thought I'd give fiction a shot. So, um, and I've, and I've loved it. I've enjoyed it very, very much, but no, I can't say that I have been writing since I was, uh, you know, five, six. I, 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 I didn't. You mentioned that uh, the, there is a huge difference between writing as a journalist and writing as a fiction author. How did you how did you make that transition? Because I, I've heard that from a lot of folks who were in nonfiction for years and then tried to switch over, and, and there was really a hard time there. Yeah, it is a hard time. I I can't say I did it very well at first, uh, but that's what rough what rough drafts are for, and that's what uh, little short stories are for. And and you you just um, like anything else, uh, you, you teach a toddler how to tie a shoe, he gets frustrated. You tell him keep practicing, and you'll get better at it. Well, you know, you keep writing, and you'll get better at it. You keep reading, and you'll be able to see uh, how a story is formatted and story arcs, and you you just you get better at it. But yes, it was hard at first um, when you are. A journalist and you are reporting about the facts of the day um, you, there are a lot of things you don't even talk about you don't talk about the the person who you who, who the, the report is about you don't talk about what they look like or what perhaps they might be thinking or uh, too much of their background you just don't do it and in fiction you make up characters out of whole cloth and you've got to get into their psyche and you've got to make the um, the readers care about your character enough to keep turning the pages and i'm really glad to hear that you liked it so far because I, I uh that's great yeah I, I find it hilarious i keep seeing the bits of myself in the lead character we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute but <laughs> i'm not sure that's all that good yeah <laughs> well you know i i don't know it, it could or could not be depends on who you ask so do you remember the first thing that you wrote fiction wise that you thought was pretty good yes i do what was it yeah, it's a story called Mail Order Monsters, and um, it actually garnered some professional interest. And uh, I, it's, it was for younger audiences, for middle grade audience, whereas God Awful Loser is um, for um, young adult audience. 
You know what? I, I didn't find God Awful Loser to be young adult at all because I'm in my 50s and I loved it. So may, maybe it's maybe it's the kid in me coming out. I'm well, you know, when sure. we were younger, I don't they, they didn't really divide um, the, the library in that way. There were children's books and then there were adult books. And I don't know about you, but I, no one ever shied me away from any book that I wanted to read. If I felt an adult book was interesting and I could understand it, I, I was allowed to read it. No one there, there wasn't this division. So so, um, so when I say young adult, that's that's where you would put it in a bookstore. But I would say if you're over 12 and you can uh, understand it, then it's meant for you. Yeah, you know, that's a really good point. I, I talk to a lot of authors now who you, you ask them what genre their book is in, and they're like, well, uh, it's a mystery, but the lead character is a 15-year-old boy. And so it, it does seem that more and more the, the lines are kind of blurring between the genres, doesn't it? Absolutely. And um, the old thinking that you had to have a, um, a young person be the protagonist in a children's book, that is going uh, the way of the dodo as well, because um, there are lots of uh, teenagers that don't necessarily want to read about a person um, their age or their gender. They, part of the joy of reading is expanding your world. And so if you um, are interested in reading about someone of the opposite gender of, you know, 20 years your elder in, in experiencing a different part of the world, well, that's part of the joy of it all. I agree. Well, the, the book is God Awful Loser. Tell us what it's about. God Awful Loser is new mythology for teenagers. It's about Cupid, um, but not the um, pink little chubby cherub that you might be thinking of with the little <laughs> arrow hearts. Um, my Cupid is all grown up, and he is um, egotistical. And, um, you know, the world revolves around love, and so therefore the world revolves around him, as far as he's concerned. Uh, so at first, he's not a very likable character. But he gets challenged for his throne by a mysterious love love angel and Cupid loses the duel spectacularly. Uh, he is exiled to earth where he finds other fallen love angels and a plot to overthrow Olympus and so he decides he's going to try to join forces with these other love angels who they don't like him very much but he's got to try to join forces with them in order to save Olympus and hopefully regain his crown. It's one thing you did really well in this book is you took a character who in the beginning was was not so lovable. He was almost anti-lovable and and through the book I don't want to say you you humanized him, but you made him a much more sympathetic character, which I, th I think is hard to do as a writer myself. Well, he got knocked down a peg. And, uh, <laughs> he did, didn't he? <laughs> and if there's anything that's going to humble you, it's being knocked down a peg. And, um, and he meets some characters who... Um, who showed him what real life is like and um, showed him how um, he could make things better for himself and the world around him if he changed his ways a little bit. Exactly. Now, how did you get the idea for the book? Uh, well, actually, I, I've always wanted to write mythology. Um, who wouldn't? You have these just these characters. These gods are all um, they're all screwed up. They have um, <laughs> they have egos that are just uh, larger than life and they have their own special powers and so I've always wanted to write mythology but the em impetus for this particular story is um, my husband and a friend were kind of um, just darting back and forth talking about uh, screenplay ideas and wouldn't it be funny if you had this fat Cupid and and you know they they talked oh you know he could be kind of uh, you know not so interesting not so nice and 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 I just took that little genesis little seed of an idea and said okay well I, I'm gonna write a little bit about it and then once I did I thought well I'm gonna write a little bit more and then I thought, I'm gonna write a little bit more and um, next thing you know I'm hundreds of pages into it and thousands of hours with uh, you know, butt to chair, as they say, and um, wrote something that I thought was worth inflicting on the world. He, he's almost a combination of Justin Bieber and Jack Black in the beginning <laughs> of the book. When when they do the movie, you got to get Jack Black to play this because it just, for some reason, I kept picturing him. So, um, and it's important for 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 the uh, for the females in the audience to know that. Um, <laughs> But he does get a little bit of his comeuppance. He's, he's, uh, yeah, Cupid does learn a thing or two about women. And, uh, and in the end, we, we meet a uh, fabulous heroine. I think she's fabulous. And, and uh, so hopefully everyone gets, gets a character that they like out of this book. Yeah, and don't you think female readers like to see a character, a male character, start out, you know, maybe not so great, but over the course of the book and perhaps meeting the right woman, they really like that, that curve that the character takes. 
Absolutely, they do. And, and you know, it's important to see redemption in your character. But, but I, I'm careful here. I don't want to go down the path of letting people think that this is a romance because um, it's, it's not a romance. It's an action adventure. And, well, because there's Cupid in it and Venus, who is his mother, yeah, there's some romance thrown in there. But primarily, it's um, an action advent adventure. And we, uh, we tried to reflect that in the cover and, uh, and, and in all the, you know, the jacket flap and all that throughout. Well, the, one of the scenes that I love is when his mother appears to him and she's, she's naked on the clamshell and he's like, Mom, put on some clothes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he has to always say that to her. He's like, Mom, cut it out. Get dressed. I need to talk with you. And she's, she distracts all the humans around her, so he, mm -hmm. he really has to kind of ring her in. Yeah. Where, where did the humor come from? Were you always a, a funny person? Uh, <laughs> you know, and, I, and I mean that with the utmost respect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's funny that you should say that. Uh, I wouldn't have thought so. And I also would not have thought of myself um, as a creative type before I started writing. But I guess, you know, when you give yourself a challenge and you uh, push past the boundaries that um, that you kind of naturally set for yourself, that you find that you um, can do more than, than necessarily you gave yourself credit for. Yeah, well, it, it is a very funny book. And I, I, I chuckled throughout. And again, the, I think the last book that made me actually laugh out loud was A Confederacy of Dunces. Have you ever read that book? I have not gotten to that one yet. I've oh had so my many God. people recommend it. Yeah, my, my favorite book it's written by... It's in my, my to-read list, which is impossibly high. Oh, well, you got to push it to the top. Trust okay. me. It's, it really... It almost... Your, your book was very remindful of that, and that is my favorite book of all time. So that is, that is again, high praise. So um, talk about your, your process now. Uh, as, you, as you wrote the book, did you do this... Uh, uh, did you have an outline to go by, or did you write by the seat of your pants, or how did you do it? I wish I could say I had a detailed outline, but I don't write that way. I write with a general goal in mind, um, heading in a certain direction, but um, I let the characters guide me the way they naturally would. And I don't do a detailed outline too much because I'm afraid I'll stilt their characters. Yeah, I think if you outline too much, you, you almost you take some of the character out of the character. Right, and when you allow the characters to be who they are, they will naturally lead you in some pretty funny directions or dramatic directions, whatever the case may be. Yeah, as you were writing this, did Cupid start talking to you in your head, telling you what to do? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But um, Venus was, was pretty bossy. She told me the way she wanted to go. She, <laughs> yeah, but uh, I'm pleased with her. She, she was right in where she needed to go. The one thing I loved about this book is, is coming from your background in journalism where, uh, as you said, you, you basically reported the facts. You didn't fill. You didn't make up stuff. Um, as a fantasy novel, this, this is pretty far out there, I think. You, you, you take on the gods and the various things that they do and the characteristics of them. And uh, uh, How much fun was that writing this story and bringing all of these characters into play? It was so much fun, Tim. You just wouldn't believe it. You know, this is this is where my writing, my reading rather, as a youth, came back into fruition. Came came back to help me. I had read lots of mythology as a child, and I just I loved it so much that when I decided to do some fiction writing as an adult, this felt really good to me. It felt really natural, and I, I had to do research, though. I mean, there are. You know, you don't know everything that, that, that's out there to know. And so I had to do a lot of research about the gods and about the locales that they go to. Um, but having said that, I didn't, become a, um, I didn't become chained to the research. I allowed myself to embellish it and create new, new things and new places. So, As you wrote the book, did you do so with the audience in mind? Meaning, uh, you know, this, this is a young adult novel. I have to write in a certain way as to appeal to the young adults. No, I wrote the book the way I wanted to write it, and then I thought about my audience, and then I tweaked the book to, uh, to make it better for them. But uh, no, I did not write every page thinking about young adults. I, one of the things that I love about this book is, is the cover jacket. Did your husband design this? Uh, my husband and I both designed it. We were together on that. Thank you for saying that, that you liked it. We worked really hard on the concept of this. Um, if you write a book about Cupid, uh, you're tempted to put Cupid on the cover. And if you do that, you are not going to have boys being willing to walk down the hallway <laughs> at school with your book. Right. And, um, and we, we tested this with a couple of uh, kids, and, and, and um, 
yeah, we just, we, we had to think long and hard how we were going to depict a funny mythology without having Cupid on the cover or something that would turn off either boys or girls because the book is meant for both. Well, I, I think you nailed it because the cover and the audience will, will put up a copy of the, uh, the cover here. Um, the thing that I really like about it are the arrow or not arrows, but the feathers that seem to be falling from the sky. <laughs> which yes, represent, well, <laughs> I guess, Cupid falling to earth, but yes. uh, very symbolic. Yes. But the thing that I love the most are the blurbs on the back of the jacket. And my <laughs> favorite one is, this is Pluto, God of the Underworld, gave you this quote, this book sucks. <laughs> yeah, he'd think it, it would suck, wouldn't he? He would, If it didn't turn he? out the way he'd like it to. <laughs> <laughs> He's just a very negative reviewer, that, that Pluto, so... Very good. Great book. So tell me uh, a little bit about getting this book out there, getting it published, getting it to market. It's one of the things that I hear from everyone that I interview is, wow, I didn't realize how much work it was going to be, even after the writing is over, to, to get the book out there. Did you? Is this uh, self-published or did you go traditionally? What did you do? This is a self-published book. My okay. husband and I created a uh, publishing company specifically for my books that are going to be coming out and also his because um, he's a well-known, uh, world-renowned fantasy illustrator and children's book artist. Oh, and he, and is, so he is so good. Thank you. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, we, he's, we... he's got a really popular YouTube channel mm -hmm. um, where he does how-to videos, and, and that has uh, – 20,000 subscribers or so ish. And yeah. so, um, you know, together we had, we had some of the skills to, to be able to, um, create a publishing house and to put out this book. Uh, it's that's three points, right? Is that the name of the company you started? Three, three points publishing. Yes. And, um, so you, you had asked about the process. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I would say that self publishing now is the easiest it's ever been. But don't take that to mean that the process is easy. Right. Um, there is a ton of time and commitment that you've got to put into the process, and it's a, a really long haul. And if you're going to do it right, you've got to learn. Um, you've got to learn to dissect what it is that traditional publishers do, so that. You can do it yourself. You've got to learn how to get the ISBN. You've got to learn how to make your copyright page. You've got to learn um, how, if, if you're going to do a hardcover book like we chose to do rather than print on demand, you have to learn how that process uh, goes, how you're going to do book layout, how you're going to um, find a manufacturer. There's a lot of work to be done, and that's not even including the social media on the back end. Well, you know what? That's what I was going to ask you is about the marketing side because that's where I think so many authors may drop the ball is they're not really marketers. And, you know, it's unfortunately, I think the thing about self-publishing, and I love your opinion on this, you know, you said it, it is easy to publish now, but that's really just a very small piece of the puzzle. It's actually the marketing uh, to sell the book. That's where the, the effort comes in, is it not? Oh, absolutely. It takes up all of your free time if you're not careful. And, <laughs> um, and, and, you know, we, we chose, um, because we chose to do an actual hardcover instead of print on demand, we not only had to do that, um, that physical side, um, but then the, you also have to do the promotion if you're not with a traditional publisher. And, uh, there are people that will look at you as if you lack clout. You have to challenge those preconceptions that people have. And um, luckily, however, we live in a time and age where you can contact readers directly. And um, at least in my instance, it's, it's been successful, especially through um, the Kickstarter that we started. Well, tell us about that. You started this off with a Kickstarter campaign to get the book published, right? Yeah, we did. Um, we, we decided that... We wanted to have this hardcover book. That was our vision. And, um, you know, there's, there's price involved in that. There's cost. Um, and so what we decided to do is to, uh, we, we put most of, um, most of the funding comes from us. We have skin in the game. But we wanted to reach out to our prospective audiences, me, my, my television fans, and Jeff, his art fans, and um, see if we could generate a little buzz about the book and generate some pre-sales and get a little help with the publishing by doing a crowdfunding program. And um, uh, we were lucky to be successfully funded in a genre that 
isn't always funded. Um, there are lots of young adult books that don't quite make it. And um, we were very lucky to, to have made our goal and we're thankful for the people that supported us. What was your goal? The goal was $2,000, which is uh, substantially less than what it costs to print the book. Um, but it was um, we wanted to have a successful Kickstarter campaign. It was important to us to, to have um, that success behind us and to, to generate some buzz and some pre-sales. And, um, and, you know, we've made some great friendships out of it. We've developed some relationships from people that uh, backed our Kickstarter, and we in turn have backed other people's Kickstarters. And um, they're going, they're built in audience for the next book. Um, and, uh, and we're just grateful for the support they've given us. I think this is a really novel approach because I talked to so many authors who who do want to go you know and and publish the book on their own and they do need the funds to do it and I don't think it would occur to a lot of them to do a Kickstarter campaign then again a lot of them may not have the success that you had because of of your uh, your connections and and that sort of thing but uh, congratulations I mean that's not something you hear about a lot actually having having readers and fans fund your book that must that must have felt pretty good it did. It did feel really good. Um, and, you know, the nice thing about these crowdfunding programs is you reward backers with extras. Uh, either you give them a lower price on the product or you, you give them something that they can't get elsewhere. And that's the incentive for them. And um, my husband being an artist, as I told you, he's, he's uh, done stuff for Star Wars and Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons and Mars Attacks. And so he, he, has, he has a following and he did art prints exclusive Kickstarter art prints to go with the book. So he created illustrations of Cupid and Mars and Pluto and Venus and those were a really big hit and it was fun for him and it was a chance for us to finally collaborate because um, you know, uh, my television world and his um, fantasy illustration world those are pretty separate <laughs> if you think about it and this was our first chance to collaborate. It was, it was great. Now, what is his name? Jeff Miracola. Okay, yeah. When you and I first started talking a while back, I went and looked at some of his stuff, and I'd actually seen it before. And uh, I'm like, wow, this guy is just is amazing. So how does one as, uh, as talented as he find one as talented as you? <laughs> I chased him down. <laughs> I, I chased him down. I met him somewhere after sixth grade, and I pursued him ever since. Did you really? Sixth grade? <laughs> I did. We started dating in 11th grade, and while we were both in high school, we didn't go to the same high school. And, um, yeah, and I, I pounced and snagged him, and he didn't stand a chance. And now he's mine, and I can't get rid of him. Help me, Tim. Oh, my God. <laughs> 9 one, one. I love that. <laughs> Well, he is very talented, and, and I want you to use him up until he's gone. So uh, now <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk about the next book. What are you working on now? I'm working on the sequel to God Awful Loser. It's called God Awful Thief. Mm. It's got some new characters in it um, that, uh, oh, they're fun. They're fun. Um, they're, they love mixing things up and getting into trouble. Can you give us a, uh, just a little quick plot line of what it's about without giving it away? Uh, sure. Um, Cupid has, having been, oh gosh, I don't, want to, I don't know that I want to give this away. Um, <laughs> Cupid is still uh, in the celestial world, let's just say, and he has been asked to, uh, to help the kingdom by stealing something from another god. And uh, he enlists the help of, um, actually he doesn't enlist, another god pushes his way into this project. And um, they don't get along very well. And um, this other god is trying to uh, steal Cupid's girl and um, throw all sorts of uh, wrenches into the project. So, uh, yeah, so that's as much as I can tell you okay. right now. I'll give it all away. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good teaser. So, so what are your days like now? You're still doing television. When do you find time to write? Uh, I do television occasionally. I find time to write mostly on the weekends, actually, um, because I'm still um, taking care of my kids. I've got three kids, an 18-year-old, 16-year-old, and a 14-year-old, and I'm trying to get the eldest to college, and um, <laughs> she's going to be, no, she's accepted, and she's, she's going to be going in the fall, and um, so I'm, I'm still quite involved in their lives, so I spend um, a lot of my weekdays 
uh, take, taking them, you know, being their chauffeur and being their chef and taking them different places. And my, my best writing time is on the weekend. I wish I could say, Tim, that I write every day and have a word count like a lot of the other authors that you have interviewed, but um, that would just be a lie. Yeah, well, those authors didn't have three teenagers either. So. Yeah, so there. <laughs> so there. So what do your, your kids, especially your oldest, think of your, uh, of your book? Has she read it? Oh, yeah, they've all read it, and I've told them that they better tell everyone they loved it. Um, no, <laughs> no they, they did. They all, they all really, really liked it. They, they, I think they were a little surprised uh, that I had that kind of creativity in me. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's weird that they have the opportunity to sit down right next to the author of a book and read the book and, <laughs> and, and interrogate the writer right then and there. Yeah, I, well, tell that to my 19-year-old. Because she, she, you know, I, I write, I write mysteries basically based in the South and she spent about an hour in my office yesterday telling me why I must change and start writing, uh, vampire trilogy books. Oh, well, there you yeah. go. And you know, whatever princess says goes. <laughs> I'm like, sweetheart, do you know your dad? <laughs> Can you really picture me writing those? So, uh, but yeah, she's... Uh, you know, it's funny though, Tim, they have said what you said, that they see snippets of themselves in the different characters. And um, that just pleases me to no end because I, you know, you try hard to humanize your characters and to make people care about them. And if they find a little bit of themselves in those characters and you've succeeded at least a little bit. Exactly. I, well, in my second book, I actually named a character after my youngest daughter and she was this really strong, bitchy young woman. Nope. And, uh, and of course, my daughter read the book and she's like, is that supposed to be me? And I'm Dad, like, yeah, that's, that's you, me. darling. A nail on the head. So, so do you ever think about uh, writing in, in another genre? You're enjoying writing in the, uh, in the young adult, the fantasy here. Is there another interest for you? Yes, I'd like to write horror someday. Ah, and why is that? What, what draws you to that? Oh, you know, that was another thing that I loved to read as a kid. I loved to just, you know, read the, the scary ghost stories or just the suspense stories, the mystery stories. Um, and, and, you know, it's, I don't know if I could write it, but, you know, it's a challenge. And it's good to expand your boundaries and to try something new. So, yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to give that a shot someday. Very good. Sylvia Acevedo, and I almost said your name correctly. We went through you this did. previously. So my, uh, I'll get my son-in-law on it. He's the Spaniard in the family. So uh, the book is God Off a Loser, one of my favorite books of the year, and I don't say that lightly. I, just, I thought this was great. Thank you so much, Tim. I appreciate it. You know, I'm waiting on the second book. I'm, I'm getting to it. I'm writing it as fast as I can. I'm telling you, I'm going for it. When do you think it'll be done? Oh, I think um, I'm hoping to get it out in May of next year so that there's a year between the books. I don't want to make my audience wait too long. I don't think that's yeah, very nice. I agree. Tell folks where they can find out more about you and your books. They can find out everything they need to find out by going to SylviaAcevedo.com, and they can find all my links to Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and the book, and everything that they need right there. Very good. We will put up links. Sylvia, this has been fun. we got to do it again. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Interviewing Authors Podcast with your host, Tim Knox. We'll see you next time.